Good morning, everybody. My name is Lynn McNair. I'm the head of Cowgate Under Five Centre in Edinburgh, and I'm a senior teaching fellow at the University of Strathclyde. Eh, I'm not Strathclyde, at eh, the University of Edinburgh. And what a palaver I've had getting here today, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm a Frobelian trained. I uh, trained in London at the Frobel Institute in Roehampton University. Before going on to talk about um, uh, literacy and, and maths in a classroom, Froebel would, any Frobelian practitioner would have to look at the view of the child. So any practitioner, the view that they they view children as rich, resourceful, able, capable, trustworthy. So, um, so if a, a, if a practitioner starts from the point of view that when the child walks in the room, they think of them as vulnerable or needy or um, an empty vessel, that old uh, phrase, um, they would not be classed as Frobelian practitioners. So it's from a very rich um, uh, position. Epistemic boundedness I've put in there, um, if you know much about uh, brain studies um, and the limits that people uh, or children are supposed to achieve, Froebel would never have really have looked at it that way. He would always have seen that every child has immense potential and were always surprising us. Um, so that I think that I put that there because I think it really is a trigger. So terms like full potential would never, and we're still doing it. So. <laughs> um, so uh, terms like full potential, a Frobelian uh, practitioner would never really use. Because I don't know about you, but I know for sure I've not reached my full potential. And um, I'll only reach my full potential, I think, when I'm dead, and maybe even after that, who knows. But um, certainly not, not yet. And I certainly think when we hear phrases like children have reached their full potential or they should be reaching their full potential, I think, what is that about? Thanks. Um, I also think it's important to, uh, Froebel would talk about what you focus on is what grows, so um, if you're seeing children as rich and able and capable and competent, that's what you'll get, I think, that's what he believed. He believed that if you, um, you know, focus on a child as needy or unable to achieve something, that again will be um, enhanced. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Froebel's principles um, because in all our work, all our principles that underpin our practice really um, influence how we are in the playroom or the classroom. So if you can see these, um, a recognition of the uniqueness of each child's capacity and potential, a holistic view of development, an ecological view of mankind, a recognition of the integrity of childhood, a recognition of the child as part of a family, and the importance of play in a classroom. Now, um, these principles, I, I think you could actually take Froebel's name away from it and still have very high quality uh, practice. If Froebel's name wasn't mentioned, because some people critique that it was um, in the 1800s, Actually, if I look at those principles and I think if they guide my practice, I'm doing a really good job. Um, you know, because children's rights and everything come into this. Thanks. Also very fundamental to Froebel was the environment in which uh, children occupied. And um, it was educative rather than merely amusing. If you walked into a Froebelian environment, children have a lot of freedom and it's quite a liberal space and it can look to the untrained eye that there's not a lot of learning taking place but actually it really is about the, the sensitivity of the uh, pedagogue in that space. Um, and he talked about promoting um, independence as well as uh, interdependence in this community space. So we know that um, really working with parents was absolutely key in a Frobelian world. And, and the outdoors was really significant. So this wasn't simply um, outdoors, a space to run around and give children a break from being inside all day. It actually had a purpose. It was um, 
the outside space should be um, somewhere where children are engaging with the natural world and perhaps um, uh, uh, planting and eating their, um, their harvesting their, um, what they're growing. Thanks. <clears throat> the pedagogy is really important, so um, I'll talk a lot, I think, today on the importance of first-hand experiences. Encouragement rather than punishment. In a Frobelian classroom, there would be no punishments that you would see. There would be no golden time. There would be none of those um, sheets that go up. Because Frobel believed that the environment, <clears throat> it, it wasn't the child's behaviour that was at fault, but the environment that they occupied. And I'm really happy to talk more about that. My PhD uh, looked at that. Um, and also, very importantly, um, knowledgeable and appropriately qualified ch childhood practitioners. And I know that play for some uh, primary teachers wasn't always a focus. And so I think that that is certainly something that um, he would think was really significant in the training. Thank you. A Frobelian um, practitioner is also a participatory pedagogue. Um, and rather than it being, I, I talked earlier about the importance of the child, celebrating the child's being a curious, competent and participant being. And I think that um, this is really significant when we're thinking about a, a Frobelian world. <clears throat> there are loads of different uh, pedagogical practices or approaches around. You'll all know that. You'll all know um, which ones you align yourself to. But I think fundamentally there's two um, major ones. So the transmissive pedagogue and the participatory one. So as I say, the, a participatory one's much more about the child being curious and competent and um, a, a participant being where the educator is listening to the child documenting what they're learning and um, providing this kind of companionship. And it's very different from a kind of transmissive pedagogue. Uh, so uh, seeing the child as a not yet being as they arrive into the classroom and also this uh, kind of culture of silence that can sometimes, we know that can sometimes occur. <coughs> Again, um, one of the other significant things is that uh, error in a participatory pedagogical world is seen as um, something for children to learn about, uh, whereas in a transmissive pedagogue, it's in, oh, this child is a bit deficit, we need to do something about that. Whereas in a, a Frobelian world, it'd be turned into a positive. And relationships and interactions are at the heart of a, a participatory pedagogical approach. I spoke to three head teachers before coming here today. Um, they, uh, one was from Glasgow, one is from um, outside Edinburgh, more east, and one is from Edinburgh. And they were all Frobelian trained and they are um, desperate to have a Frobelian uh, influences in all of their, their classrooms. And we discussed at length about what the core provision of the classroom could look like, and we all agreed uh, that it would look um, very, it would mirror a, a, a nursery class or nursery school with lots of the basic provision. There are um, loads and loads of um, academic papers on play. I, you'll all have your favourites, I'm sure. I actually um, really trust in these 12 features of play by Tina Bruce and as I say the importance of first-hand experiences from life um, really is a, a key one for me so if I was teaching on uh, farm animals I would really think it was important to take a child to the farm first if I was teaching words about uh, transport and trains for example I would want them to experience the train first and um, and we know that that actually really does support uh, learning. So that if I, I was teaching them about police, for example, you could invite a policeman into the classroom rather than it being very abstract. Certainly in P1 to 3, I would say, they need these very, very real experiences. 
I looked at lots of research before coming today and there's actually a wealth of research that talks about if you have children in a kind of formalised um, teaching environment or if you have them in a play environment, um, actually children do better later in academic schools in literacy and maths. And there's a wealth of uh, experience, um, research out there. I looked at uh, two case studies that I just want to share with you. Um, I, I, at the beginning, I never said that I actually teach um, seven Froebel courses up and down the, the country. There's one here in Glasgow. And some of the students do, all the students actually, when they participate in this course, do a development project as part of the, the course outcome. And they, and I, I selected just two basic ones for today. And there's lots of similarities, so um, I thought that in my limited time that I could actually uh, squeeze two in. So the first, uh, the, the case study one, looked at um, introducing free flow play into her classroom. And the second one looked at how they plan. Five minutes left, oh, I better be very fast. I'll be very fast now. Thank you. Um, so case study one uh, labelled all their, um, their resources because she really believed that that would um, encourage the children to be much more independent so they could go and select uh, resources in the classroom without coming and asking permission from the teacher to do so. And that really worked for her. And the other one really wanted to create a kind of responsive planning where children led the planning. Thank you. The, the, they both kind of said a similar thing along this, that schools tended to privilege certain types of knowledge, and in particular uh, with regards to literacy and numeracy. And so they wanted to kind of challenge this, because they thought that with this, that a deficit view of the child uh, existed. This, this uh, case study, she, she realised very quickly that she had been um, preparing all the uh, literacy experiences for the children and actually she thought she wasn't really, um, the children weren't learning as much as she'd actually hoped. She um, started changing things like how she set up her water tray, um, she would have much more um, measuring materials in there, she would uh, add um, uh, like the children were really interested in writing and she would uh, have little envelopes and things and, and really just building up. So she saw herself more as a guide and a facilitator, but she said that they were really um, motivated to learn because they were actually interested in what, what she was, what they, were, what they were doing. And she saw her job as kind of facilitating that. And she, she looked about her planning. She started to say she actually noticed a lot more about the children's learning. And she um, really saw this, uh, this being motivated from the children. Sorry, I know I'm speaking really fast. 15 minutes is a long, a short time. Um, and she realized that the, the observations she'd um, been doing before, the recording she'd been doing before, she really started questioning what, what, what was it for? She really didn't think it was about building on children's learning. And she, she, after the Froebel course, she really believed that her philosophy had changed and she wanted to move away from the kind of structured way of being in the classroom and really building on children's interests. Um, she also noticed that, um, and I, I totally agree with this from my own experience, that um, children were less likely to define and approach an activity if, as play if an adult was present. She had, uh, one of the conclusions, conclusions she made was that um, she felt that the adult's role was really significant. Mm -hmm. um, so, thanks, I'll zoop. Next one. This was a wonderful one, and I don't know if, will you have access to these slides? Mm -hmm. Great, so um, you'll read them yourself, and obviously I've just selected certain bits, but this was really somebody that stood back and never imposed on the child and actually was amazed at what she learned when she came at it from a completely different point of view. And she talked about um, first-hand experiences, and again, um, I realise there's lots of text here, but you can certainly get hold of this. 
and the importance of this. And she talked about the, um, the questions that this opened up from this first-hand experiences that she'd never really experienced before. And she also um, included the family in this and changed her whole strategy of what she was doing and how she included the family. And that too was immensely rich. And so she really um, thought that this had changed all her um, the way and she realized that she'd learned so much more about the children's language and literacy development. Thank you. Um, and there's a couple of quotes there for you to think about. I think I'll just go right on. There's, there, there's some challenges, of course, adult-child ratio, sometimes the confidence of the teacher to um, enable this and stand back. Training, have they been trained in play? Perceived pressures versus real pressures. This came from the head teachers who said they'd be willing to take the responsibility, but the teachers themselves were frightened. Um, no, really, one more slide, is that okay? I'll be very quick. Um, so this is really what we were saying, what an ideal um, a, a Fabelian classroom would look like. And um, as I say, you'll get this. So no uniforms, first names, um, maybe early level going to P2. Thanks very much for listening. You're, you can, I can take questions. I'm sorry that that's been a whistle-stop tour to that. Thank you very much.